in very rapid time have become a very comprehensive research extension and teaching institution that crosses all of Oregon State University and we now are trying to touch all aspects of the hemp industry across not only Oregon but the United States and even uh, globally. I uh, got my master's degree in biology and then my PhD degree in agroecology. In 2016, January, I moved to US and I did my first postdoctoral research at Montana State University, working on a field crop, mainly on a wheat, uh, alfalfa, uh, focusing on uh, integrated pest management. In 2019, January, I moved to Oregon State University, working uh, at a Harmiston Agricultural Research and Extension Center, again as a postdoc, working on a potato uh, insect pest control, uh, mainly on a landscape uh, ecology and trying to understand how the uh, insect move from uh, in, in across the landscape. So that's kind of my, uh, my background. And uh, so I started my job again in 2004 uh, months back. So as like Jeff mentioned that I am a statewide guy, so, but my responsibility is 70% uh, in the Southern Oregon and then 30% across the state. So I'm mainly focused here, but also like, you know, uh, across, the st across the state. So in my program, my, my aim is to develop or build a uh, extension focus program uh, on um, hemp production and integrated pest management and that will eventually help to the hemp grower uh, to boost the economy or any kind of things. Since I started this job uh, like a uh, four month back and uh, and my presentation title is updates. So what's going on in the state? And I think sometimes I feel it's very interesting and also sometimes I feel it's very challenging, you know, to cover what's going on. So when I was kind of preparing the handouts, I thought, why can't, you, why can't I divide this whole update based on the different sections? Like what's going on a crop improvement program? What's going on a crop management practices? What's going on IPM program? So I divided the handouts based on the three category. So crop improvement program or plant breeding program and then uh, crop management practices and then uh, an IPM program. And what I am trying to do it in, the, in this handout is just to give you the kind of b brief info and then provide the contact information so that you know you can connect with that person so, you know, not only that particular research but also kind of you know because these are the expert on that area for example in agronomy so you can connect if you have some questions so my overall goal here on this uh, uh, giving the update is just to give you an idea just to give you an idea what kind of research is going on and and helping you to connect with them and that's my things. So I'm gonna start my talk on my first, as I say, like plant building or crop improvement program. So like Jeff already mentioned that one of the key program that we are doing is national cannabinoid varietal trial. And that is kind of, uh, uh, this is partnering with several universities across the nations. Uh, like also already Jeff mentioned that there are several, several universities that are being together and partnering on this uh, big, uh, big task. So the, 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 the main goal of this uh, study is to, to determine how different hemp variety perform across the nation. That's the one main key objective of this uh, study. And second is that does the hemp feed can fit well in a rotation with other crop? And, and the third is like how the crop genetic and environment can affect the management practices. So these are the three kind of, uh, you know, threefold objective, the overall goal, uh, uh, objective of this kind of research. Uh, and, uh, and we have the research location, like already Jeff mentioned, we have a two location here in Central Point, the rich uh, director from the, the, the Southern Oregon, he's doing that part. And, and another is in Ontario, Clean Sock, with a professor Emirate from OSU, he's doing that part. As you can see in the picture on the, on the figure number one, the Clean Sock is standing at the right side of the National Varietal Trial at Ontario, Oregon. And also I mentioned the date, so you can know when this picture was taken on the date, so give an idea about, uh, the, about, about the plant. So, and for this study, we have both full season and auto flowering type. So this is kind of the one uh, study that uh, the OSU is doing on a uh, plant breeding. And second is a hemp germplasm project. So this is the text is given by me from the 
from the Suji and the Robert who are leading this project. I asked him, can you give me the update about what kind of your things going on? So this all text is written by, by them. So what they are basically doing, what OSU is doing is OSU is collab, uh, partnering or collaborating with uh, University of California Davis, uh, Washington State University and USDA uh, to obtain, characterize and evaluate the germ plasma. So that is a kind of what, uh, what collaborating and now they are kind of pre-breeding program. So they are trying to build the uh, involve the development of germ plasm that can be distributed to farmers and breeder and will be made available publicly available through the USA hemp germ plasm repository. So I think that at the end they will be available to the grower or everyone. That's what they say. And I have given her contact information. So if you have any wanted to know about this project, you can you know directly reach out or you can you or you can if they if or you can ask me then I can help you to connect with them about this project. So that's what I have it from uh, plant breeding and crop improvement program. So I'm going to move to to the, the crop management practices. If you move on other page, so here is the one uh, Western U.S. water use trial. That's one one of the the trial that is cooperative irrigation trial in Oregon, California, and Colorado. So this, this trial, I think we'll talk more, uh, Tom will talk more about it on later on, but this trial has a uh, four different level of water uh, from, um, and, and the rate is different based on the auto flower or full seasons. So overall goal is that how much plant can, you know, take the, the, the what, how much water is demanding from the plant. So that's what they are doing here. And then from this study, what they are doing is that they are uh, determining the flower yield, cannabinoid content and cannabinoid yields that are recorded in this study. So for this, uh, as, you, as you can look at, I forget to mention you that on um, this is the, the, if you look at there, it's uh, auto flowering on the right side. So this is the kind of water use trial at Ontario. And, uh, and uh, this is the, this is uh, the OSU, uh, this is the OSU Hermiston, uh, this is the water use trial at Hermiston. And this is the kind of picture taken from the drone. So I asked them colleague to take it. So just to give you an idea about what kind of trial and study is going on. Just to give you again, uh, the, the the contact person is that if you are from Harmiston or Eastern side, you can contact Scott Lucas, who is the assistant professor there, to know about what's going on there on that side. And the clean sock with the retired uh, professor Emirate at Ontario, you can talk with them in that particular area, what kind of results they are getting. And a climate fall here, the Tom, I think Tom will talk later on about his trials. So that's kind of the, the, the overview of the Western U.S. water, U.S. trial, and also you can talk with the Jeff on that point of what kind of things going on happening. And then there is another study that we, we are doing irrigation and plant density trial at Southern Oregon, and uh, the, the Rich will talk later that, and he has his handout, so you, you'll know more about that information from him, so I'm not going to talk about that part. So now I'm going to talk about a little bit about hemp grain trial. We have also on the agenda hemp grain trial. Don Wasaki will talk about it, but just to give an idea about this study has two objectives. One is to know whether the hemp grain we can grow the hemp grain crop or not in a dry land we are talking about a dry land so if yes and then what are the nitrogen application rate to like a, does it impact the yield level does it impact the plant nutrient optics so these are the kind of two basic research he's doing and as you, uh, as you can see this big, the, the picture that he and I did like uh, almost spend a day on a sampling the plants for that you know the study and I think this is study, uh, you'll talk about this more study, more about this results and finding, but for this study that he used X59 as a variety for this one. So this is what kind of trial we have been doing on a uh, hemp crop improvement program. Now I will move to the, the, the IPM program. That's what I think, uh, the, that what's my also little bit expertise, I have been working on that area. So one of the, the beauty uh, of that, you know, Oregon State University have the research center I need to wait. Yeah, maybe I can talk now. Yeah, you know. The Oregon State University has a, one of the beauty is that it has a research center across the state. Actually, it helps uh, to kind of collaborate in you know, working together uh, the needs uh, and a problem on hemp. So we kind of started this summer uh, the statewide hemp pathogen survey. And, uh, and we did uh, this survey on the eastern, central, southern, and western region of the Oregon. So what we did, what is the goal of this study? Just to identify what are the common problems. What are the common pathogens, and does it differ, or does it 
is there any difference between the region? Is there any same problem that we are seeing here? Is the same like in the like in the eastern or in the central? So overall goal is just to understand the the, the just to identify the common problem or specific to the region. So that's a, that's a goal. And what we did is that. Uh, we survey uh, each region at least three fields. It's all in the farmer's fields, and then for that study, what we did is like we we plan we survey at a three time point, early in the season, mid in the season, and now like in the harvesting season. So actually yesterday, not yesterday, and uh, on Wednesday I was surveying the the you know the the hemp pathogen in the eastern uh, Oregon. So just to give you an idea about. So we are wanted to see. We wanted to cover the all picture about what going on on the disease or pathogen. So what we did on this one is that we kind of uh, identify the pathogen either by visually or kind of diagnostic assay or molecular method. We are using the multiple approaches to make sure that what kind of pathogen or what kind of disease problem we have. One of the, I mean, it's too early to share the results, but I want to kind of point out some of the things that we are seeing. One of the com one of the common problem that we are seeing is that beet colita virus, as you can see in the picture, uh, that is mainly on the central and eastern side. We have not found out in this area, like in the southern. Just to give you an idea about it. And another thing is that like we have seen mainly the, the soil one pathogen that's mainly in the southern but just to give you an idea this is kind of my assessment we need to sit down and kind of you know the whole working group and sit down and discuss the whole data set but this is just kind of first look that we have been seeing the problem you know that I just want to read the name because I, I think it, it deserves to read the name we are involving on this project so Western region there's a Cynthia uh, M. Ocam. sorry if I have uh, pronounced it uh, uh, wrongly. She's an extension plant pathologist and uh, working at OSU Corvallis. Another is Hannah Rividal, who is, who is a USDA research plant pathologist in Corvallis. And in, at southern region, Achala Nepal from Southern uh, Oregon Research and Extension Center. She's a plant pathologist. And Gordon John here is, ex there is he is agricultural extension specialist. And myself, I have been involving on that. Uh, and the central region is Jeremiah Dong, who is a plant pathologist on the, on the OSU Madras and Eastern region, uh, Ken Frost and myself. So Ken Frost is a issue uh, plant pathology at Hermiston. I'm so sorry, actually. <laughs> In the Road Valley, uh, Jackson and Josephine counties, because there is such a high concentration of the hemp uh, organs, hemp acres, that uh, we are putting Oregon State is putting quite a bit of effort into hemp research and extension. And I, and I did want to mention, in addition to Govinda, whom you've heard from, and Gordon Jones, who you'll hear from in a second, um, he mentioned our plant pathologist at Chala KC, who primarily works on wine grapes and pears but she is, is helping uh, and doing some work in the plant disease aspect. Uh, Rick Hilton right here in the front row is our uh, entomologist, research entomologist at SOREC uh, for, for many years. Uh, and he primarily also works in pears and wine grapes, but he's been involved in, in, in some hemp issues as well. Uh, and, and hiring Govinda as a full-time hemp person has, has really helped. So there's quite a bit of, quite a bit of effort of Oregon State at SOREC and we cooperate with all the other stations and other locations as, as Govinda and Jeff have been describing previously. So so the last two years have been a steep learning curve and I just wanted to um, uh, briefly mention a couple of research things. There's no time to go through a lot of detail today but on the second page I just want to show you there's a, an aerial picture of our hemp the uh, hemp experiments from last year. Actually, this is not quite all of the experiments. There's some that's not in the picture. But the lower several rows, that's, that is the national variety trial location. 
at SORAC, the location that we had at SORAC last year. Um, six different varieties replicated there. And then above that, sort of towards the top of the picture, is where we did a, a density trial, and I wanted to look at what is the effect of you know, wide spacing versus very closely spaced plants, both auto flower types and full season types, and, and how does that affect the plant architecture, the flower production, and ultimately uh, the CBD, uh, in this case the CBD is the essential oil that we were interested in. And I want to give you just a two minute version of the, uh, the data results from a couple of these agronomic trials because that's my background. I'm a soil scientist by training and so agronomic aspects are what I know a little bit about. And so I couldn't, couldn't let a field day go by without throwing a little bit of data at you. So, uh, in, in, so in two minutes I'll try to go through this. But on the first page that has a graph uh, in that handout, and that is a uh, irrigation study where basically we were looking at when you dramatically, in, when you go from two inches of irrigation up to a ridiculously high amount, I think, uh, for the Medford area, about 40 inches of irrigation, what happens in that range? That's too high, of course, and two inches I think is too low, but we want to see what happens to the plants. And big surprise, when you put more water on, the plants get bigger, up to a point, up to a point, right? And on that graph, that upper line, the green line, that's the, the stem and the leaf biomass per plant in this study. But, but we also uh, pick up more flowers, more secondary flowers, that's the pink circles, tertiary flowers, that's the blue circles. Um, we also increase. So, so, so can you increase? Can you increase uh, CBD production by by increasing irrigation? Yes, you can, up to a point. Uh, and, and that's shown in the lower graph where the yellow sort of goldish line and dots show the CBD yield per acre. How many pounds of CBD per acre? You can up to a point, but then the question becomes, okay, I've, I've doubled, a little over doubled my CBD production, but I've gone from just a couple inches up to a, a ridiculously high amount of, of irrigation. And so then that becomes an economic production question is really uh, how much water do I have, first of all, in a year like this? That's the first question. Do I have any water? And then second of all, what value is there? Uh, what is the value of that water relative to the increased um, uh, value of the CBD? And then on the back page, the last thing I'll talk about before turning it over to Gordon is a, a density study that we did. Again, an agronomic idea, looking at the idea if you have plants and they're widely spaced and they're not interacting with each other, what happens if you squeeze those plants closer and closer together and have an extremely high density? How does that affect the plant architecture, the number of flowers, and of course, ultimately, in this case, the CBD yield? So on the top graph, um, where it says plant density study, That was a good one, yeah, nice. It's kind of like fireworks on the 4th of July. Which ones are gonna be the big boomers and which ones are gonna be just... So anyway, uh, that's where that is. So, so the plant density study, basically we started with a very low density, 4,000 plants per acre. Those are, those are pretty widely spaced plants and all the way up to an extremely high, a higher density, about 32,000 plants per acre. And looking at that graph, we can see the plants do compensate as they spread further apart. They will produce more stem, more leaf, uh, more flower. And that's not, you know, not too surprising, but I was a little surprised that they continue to compensate even at a very, very low, uh, a very, very low density. When the plants are widely spaced, they produce a lot more secondary flowers, more tertiary flowers. Um, more so than I was anticipating, uh, actually, I guess. And so then the last graph at the very bottom of that, again, looking at the CBD yield per acre, it gets at the question, can you increase the CBD yield per acre by squeezing those plants together and having more plants, realizing that each of those plants is going to have gradually fewer flowers? The answer is yes, you can increase the CBD yield. Uh, you can double it in, in the range here, but the data is very widely scattered first of all and second of all if you think about the logistics of either 
direct seeding, which is what we did, or even more complicated, is um, transplanting. You know, we went from 4,000 plants to 32,000 plants, so eight times the number of plants, and we only ended up with roughly a double of the CBD yield. So that, so that's real. Those numbers are real, I believe. But it gets back to the question: What does it cost me per seed? What does it cost me to plant these things? How does the plant spacing affect my other uh, management activities? Um, things like uh, how humid is it? Am I going to run into powdery mildew problems near harvest time uh, if I don't have good air circulation? All those kind of questions. So I'll stop there and I'm going to turn it over to Gordon Jones who has, has done a very interesting study uh, looking at harvest timing and are there cues the plants are giving us to help us determine the best time to maximize uh, essential oil yield? Uh, thank you, Rich. And I guess I want, I want to encourage us to pause at this moment. I'm seeing many folks have left their chairs, likely because of the coldness of the shade. I think I'm going to vote that we all stand up and we go walk over to the hemp planting and lay eyes on that, and it'll be quieter over there, I'm sure. The state to deal with it, um, it comes to my desk and have spent quite a bit of time on hemp over the past few years and glad to see a, a strong team forming, um, forming uh, recently. So let's see, survey question, how many folks uh, have grown hemp? I, uh, raise, raise your hands in the past couple years, grown some hemp. See a small handful, maybe five or six folks. So uh, look into those folks. Um, how do you make a determination on when your hemp is ripe for harvest? If you are not thinking about the weather, not thinking about labor or drying facilities, but just thinking about optimal timing to harvest uh, hemp, particularly with uh, CBD or quality flour in mind. What's, what's, you got a rule of thumb? White hairs. White hairs? No more white hairs. No more white hairs. You're talking about the uh, female floral part of the uh, flower. Those are called stigmas. They'd like reach out and catch pollen and hopefully not catch pollen in this case. Um, and so wanting to see those senesce from being fresh to being dry and sort of brown and crunchy. Other cues on? Density of flour. Density of flowers, certainly. I do like lots of time out in the field and watch even people as we walk over, like just give them a little squeeze, like how full is that? Um, get the new, um, these are not that mature to my mind, are pretty light to the touch. Uh, vocab word is a larfy. I don't know where that comes from other than must be the marijuana industry. Any other cues on when to harvest? Colors of leaves. Colors of leaves, what are you looking for? Well, usually the plant will know in tells itself and it'll eat up all its color. See see yellowing of some of some of the older leaves in the plant. Yep. Absolutely. And so I think those are all reasonable methods and folks who have been in the hemp or cannabis industry often have a way of looking at a crop and saying, yep, this is about ready or give it another week or hope you had your pre-harvest test done because this needs to get harvested tomorrow. Um, we have a cha an academic challenge as we start to work on uh, variety trials where we want to plant a dozen varieties right next to each other. And like all plants, there'll be a little bit of variation in the maturity. Some will be ready a week earlier, some will be ready a few weeks later. And so now I'm trying to do a sort of fair and scientific trial on when do I harvest all of these at the right point. If I harvest them all on one date, some will probably be immature and some will be over mature. And how do we like sort of suss through that, uh, through that question so that we've got something scientifically valid? And so I was pretty pushing pretty hard at Jeff and the folks from the Global Hemp Innovation Center on like, no, seriously, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna decide when to harvest this? Um, and they turned back around to me as sometimes happens in the world and said, Gordon, that's a good question. Why don't you see if you can cook up a project to figure that out? And I said, sure, I'll work on it. Um, and so uh, used one of our variety trials uh, back in Central Point last year and went out weekly from uh, about the time when you see the first floral tissues when flowering is initiated all the way through what I would call very late, almost the first of November, and each week took flower samples. Um, one of the visual cues that I had read about, or some growers might tell you, is the status of uh, trichomes, the color of trichomes, and trichomes are sort of hair-like appendages that occur on uh, cannabis plants. 
I don't know that you can see them very well here, but if you got in close and really peered, you'd see these little sort of what look like droplets. You can, uh, if you've got the handout, uh, you can see that zoomed in photo and on a, uh, it's a little bit blurry. There's some little sort of like crystal like droplets. Those are the glandular heads of trichomes. That is the location of a cannabinoid production within a hemp plant that those trichomes are, are like the spot where it happens. And marijuana growers tell me that uh, they expect to see a progression of clear trichomes to cloudy trichomes to sort of amber or golden colored trichomes. And I can read that in lots of uh, like how to grow some great marijuana at home books, find really very little science that indicates that that would correspond to um, something related to the cannabinoids in the hemp or its physiological status. Um, so harvested hemp flowers each week from uh, several different full season and several different uh, auto flower varieties. Go back to the lab, do my best in the sort of like arbitrary activity of guessing at a proportion of clear, cloudy, and amber trichomes. Uh, dry those samples, send them to the lab. Um, USDA lab in uh, Peoria, Illinois that the Innovation Center has been, uh, been working with somehow took six months to get test results back. They arrived at my desk just like two months ago on the cannabinoid results from, uh, from last year. And so on that handout, on the uh, right hand side, I presented you uh, some full season, uh, this is Lifter, one of the Oregon CBD, pretty high cannabinoid yield, uh, full season varieties. Uh, I think the upper graph is the total uh, CBD and the lower graph is total THC. I want you to bear in mind that I was not looking at the whole plant. I was not looking at all the flowers. I was taking samples of the top two inches of flower. And I chose top two inches because uh, one of the previous versions of the USDA's final hemp rule was that pre-harvest testing was going to happen on top two inch samples. That has now changed several times and they've moved back to the uh, an eight inch sample or approximately eight inch sample for for current rules, but regardless. So those numbers are correspondent to what must be a pretty concentrated part of the plant, primarily floral tissue. Um, something that st strikes me as I look at those cannabinoid data and whatever sort of week one is, is probably the last week in August and week 10, if it runs that far, is I think the last day of October, that in the course of about four weeks, you go from I'm not looking at my sheet, but it goes from maybe like 4% uh, CBD up to 15% CBD in about four weeks. I would call that a very fast accumulation of cannabinoids. Uh, if you look at the two charts and just sort of squint at them, they really do follow the same pattern where, and we know that that should happen in a, a hemp plant of the cannabinoid production being sort of all happens in parallel. If you get more CBD, you should expect to have more THC. Some of the minor cannabinoids behave differently than that, but certainly for CBD and THC, that is the pattern to expect. And um, there's not much data that is published like this, and I am frantically trying to like unplug my phone at my desk so I can sit down and write up a journal article on this, but have not had much luck yet. Um, but I do think that this is, is interesting to see how quickly those cannabinoids do uh, rise. They rise to a plateau, and that sort of makes sense that most plants at some point are mature. They basically stop growing. And from that point on, particularly if you look at the CBD content, you see a very slight decline in uh, CBD content um, after that, once you sort of reach that plateau, it's a little bit uh, declining. And I really think that that's because the plants are basically rotting in the field. And they are losing, losing tissue, leaves, and um, material are falling off. I guess the other thing that I puzzle about as I think about just those cannabinoid data, I drew in our 0.3% uh, total THC uh, regulated line, even though ODA won't get you in trouble until you're above 0.349, because they like to take a loosey-goosey rounding um, approach to, to those kind of values, um, that lifter will not pass, uh, uh, at least the lifter that I grew last year, would not have passed the, uh, uh, a, would not have uh, sort of passed as legal hemp if you had grown it to maturity. It is like halfway to maturity or less that it crosses that line. I've got some like questions for our regulators on their 
28 day pre-harvest test that we need to take a pre-harvest test uh, on one date and then begin to harvest in earnest within 28 days. And you need to pass that pre-harvest test, have less than 0.3% total THC in order to legally be able to harvest that crop, have it be sold as hemp in Oregon. Do your little counting there on, those, on that table that in one, two, three, four weeks, we go from like 0.1% THC to 0.5 or 0.6, go flying through that threshold all in that legal pre-harvest window. And so, yes, you can take a pre-harvest test that will, pass, uh, that will pass ODA's rules. Will you harvest a crop that is less than 0.3? Uh, these data and plenty of other anecdotal data from breeders across the country and other research says like no, most hemp varieties that are high CBD will not, uh, will not be legal given the sort of genetic and um, metabolic nature of how the cannabinoids are produced. Um, so I think that is all interesting outcome and worth thinking about in detail. I did find that on uh, Lifter, that in that progression of trichomes that go from basically clear to pretty cloudy to turning amber, that that point where my chart or where the cannabinoids level off, I was looking at trichomes that were mostly cloudy. They were no longer in the clear sort of immature status, and only a very few of the trichomes had turned amber, which indicates to me is maybe sort of over mature, and so. I'm not sh I am not telling you if you have a crop in the field to just go look for clear trichomes and you're going to be good to go to harvest. I'm saying in one location, in one season, with one strain, there appears to be a little bit of a visual relationship between sort of maturity status, what those trichomes look like, and answering the question of if I wait a week longer, will I get more trichomes, or excuse me, get more cannabinoids? Seems like there may be a relationship to be figured out there. Um, See a really similar pattern um, with uh, white CBG, another Oregon CBD variety, um, though uh, the CBG varieties do not accumulate such high levels of uh, THC. I'm repeating this study with uh, Lifter, white CBG, and uh, Pine Walker, one of the new uh, triploid uh, CBDV varieties on farm uh, over in near the Table Rocks uh, this year been working with grain hemp just a couple of years and the reason I got into grain hemp was uh, I didn't know anything about hemp but I was getting a lot of questions so I started doing a lot of reading and the type of growers that I work with are dryland wheat growers and how are you going to fit hemp into a dryland cropping system and uh, about two years ago um, a colleague of ours at OSU uh, Voucho Jelaskov uh, came up with an experiment that was done about uh, at I think eight locations or nine locations around the state. Um, I grew uh, that experiment uh, and it, it had some of the same treatments at all locations and, and that was my first experience was grain hemp and uh, last year uh, I got to uh, connected with uh, IND Hemp and they are contracting grain hemp in Montana and, and in the state of Washington. Well there was some grain hemp being grown just across the state line in Walla Walla County in Washington and we visited those fields and I saw a chance there to really learn something just on this growers field. Now if you if you look at grain hemp is there a grain hemp in this industry anywhere in the world. Canada. Canada. Canada has a grain hemp industry. Ukraine, uh, Ukraine Europe, other places. So uh, I've worked with canola the better part of my career. Where's most of the canola grow? Canada grows 20 million acres. So I have a lot of Canadian colleagues so I just called them up and started asking them questions uh, to learn something. Uh, can you um, transplant Canadian technology into Oregon. Um, it, you know, it, it doesn't work really great. Why? Uh, day lengths are different, heat units are different, soil types are different. So you, you can gain some information, but you can't directly transplant it. 
when I talk to my Canadian colleagues and tell them we grow 100 bushel wheat, they're in awe. So they can't use our technology, we can't use theirs. So we need to learn how to grow grain hemp in our cropping systems. And where do you start? You know, seeding rates, fertility, insect pests, varieties, those are all questions, those are all things we need to learn. And, you know, we're taking baby steps at a time here. And because I'm a soil scientist, I chose to concentrate on the nutritional part of this. So, a, in 2020, we did some sampling on this grower's field near Walla Walla, Washington. Uh, and in the handout, it's this table one. Uh, I'll just review some of the numbers on that table. You can study it um, in detail uh, at your leisure, but uh, we went there and sampled that field uh, at the early part of September when it when the grain's just starting to mature. Um, male plants were completely dried down, you know, so um, if we're going to study that in, in better detail, we might do sampling different times a year, but we did just one sampling. We sampled the male plants, just ground the whole plant. Females, we segregated into leaves, grain, and stems. And that's the data that's on this table. Uh, just to point out a couple things. The grain yield on that field, and it, it's in a, about an 18 inch rainfall. 2020 was uh, probably a little better than normal year. 1,800 pounds of grain um, on this field. Uh, and you can, you can look through this uh, from a fertility standpoint. A little less than half of the nitrogen is in the, in the seed. Uh, the, the rest is in the tissue and the stems. And, and you can go through this and look at, you know, the partitioning of nutrients in the, in the plant. Uh, this grower planted about um, 30 pounds of seed. Uh, nom nominally, that's about um, 15 seeds per square foot. Um, the stand that we counted was about eight plants per square foot. So, you know, a successful uh, plant ratio is about 50%. Half of what you plant makes a, or half the seed you plant makes a, a plant that grows to maturity. And so, yeah, there we know a little bit about seeding rate. Um, this year, uh, we, we worked with the grower. Uh, and I designed a, a randomized complete block experiment with uh, seven treatments uh, uh, on nitrogen. You know, I thought that, that is one of our, our major crop inputs is nitrogen. And, you know, we need to know nitrogen rates to, to grow this crop. We know nitrogen rates for wheat, for corn. We don't know anything about hemp. So that's the soil scientist approach learn about the main nutrient first, nitrogen. So our experiment uh, consisted of, uh, you know, no nitrogen added, 50 pounds, 100 pounds, 150 pounds, and 200 pounds of N per acre. I, th I thought that covered the range. Uh, we arranged for the grower to seed this about in early May. He calls me up the 20th of April and he goes, we need to seed because we're in a drought year and we're losing moisture. If we, if we don't seed now, we won't be able to reach moisture and we won't get a stand. So, but, you know, that was on a Friday. That Monday, we were there, we planted. Um, I have a eight foot wide no-till plot drill um, that you can vary fertilizer rates and, and uh, starter rates. So we planted that experiment at 14 uh, PLS, pure live seed, per square foot calibrated a drill, planted that, and we had to seed about two inches deep to hit moisture. Um, the grower came in right after us, planted the field around it. Um, unfortunately, uh, it didn't rain again for most of the season, and, and our stand, to me, was not uniform enough to harvest um, individual plots. We did harvest, you know, segments of row within our plots, you know, where we thought the stand was uniform enough uh, so that the nutrition that we ha w had applied 
we thought would be valid to harvest those areas where there's not or too few of plants it just doesn't make sense to try to measure nutrition on on a system like that so uh, we don't have any data yet we've harvested uh, bundles and we will be processing those uh, to learn what our nitrogen rates and some other nutrient uptake curves are in that information so that that's kind of the stage where we're we at now um, to me the challenge uh, with this crop is like any new crop um, seeding rates weed control harvest issues I mean the challenge for this grower is how do you dry this crop down and harvest the seed on it the plant stays green and the seed is shattering out um, the grower tried to desiccate this with uh, sodium chlorate, uh, didn't work. Uh, so the next choice was this crop was swath and windrowed, which dried it down, um, but tried to pick a windrow of big hemp stems up. How are you going to do it? Yeah, and the grower here used a, a pickup reel like for grass seed. You know pick up fingers and he thought he did a, a fairly good job and and I think in, in his mind compared to trying to harvest a green crop he did a good job uh, I was there when he was harvesting the first year and he kept plugging up his recleaner this is a green stuff just fill it up and it this the there was so much green it you know had to be dried down at the at the elevator this year he swathed it picked it up he you know he didn't get a hundred percent of everything but he got most of it uh, the grain when he took it to the elevator five percent moisture so did a good job of drying down um, is it perfect no we'll perfect that over time so um, there, to me there's challenges to grow this crop as a grain crop and the way we're going to do it is fit it in with our wheat cropping system handle it like a grain crop no. Do you, do you overwinter your wheat? Do you do overwintered wheat? I, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. Do you do, you do winter wheat? Oh, okay. What's the cropping rotation? Okay, they, where this um, grower grew this, the, his last crop was winter wheat. Yeah. And, you know, hemp's a spring crop, so the following year after he harvests his winter wheat, uh, plants planted the hemp the his normal rotation and you know the, it's not a whole field it's you know about a 10 acre or 20 acre area in, within a field where you know he's experimenting with this uh, but the rest of the field are, are garbanzo beans so you know he, he's fitting in his cropping system where he would plant a spring legume it's just a, another different spring broadleaf crop and there's a lot of guys like us that have a lot of things we've done, but you know, there's no uh, everybody's kind of just trying to figure it all out. Yeah, we're 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 learning to fly the plane as we're building it. Yeah, and <laughs> we're we're definitely uh, we've been talking about it for a while, and this last year this drought really kicked everybody's butt. Here is um, we have two types of plantings. We have the full season on your right, my left. Did I get that right? And then we have the um, auto flower on this side. And then uh, what they were planted, the, the full season was planted with transplants. They were shipped to us by air. We planted them the uh, following week or within a few days of planting them. We got them like on a Wednesday, Thursday, and then uh, planted them the next Monday. And then uh, the auto flower was direct seeded same day. So they're all planted the same day. Um, the spacing on the, on the full season, there are 36 inch rows and they're 30 inches apart. So that's about oh, 8,500 plants to the acre. And then the planting rate, on the, they wanted to get a high density on the auto flowers, so we planted them. We were shooting for 30 to 35,000 plants to the acre. I think we hit that target. The plants are about a foot apart and there's four rows in each bed here and then each of those beds if you just look at that as a population at that rate it's about 45,000 
but we have some area between them and if you take that area into account we're about 32,000 so we're about like corn planting corn so it's a pretty good density it did pretty well direct seeded it came up in a few days it was pretty much fully merged in a week um, you can see on here there's a fertility we had a pre-plant amount and we have done some injections uh, we did a uh, mid-season we did a leaf, leaf tissue analysis and realized we were a little low on a couple of things so we put in some phosphorus and some potassium to kind of help bring it up to normal levels and have continued to kind of do that. Uh, we're done with uh, autoflower. We harvested it week before last and uh, irrigation's off. It's been off for two weeks on it. It's just sitting here. We left it for the field day today. So it's done. So the, the experiment, it was this water use. If you look at your other page with the map on there, if you orient the north, you see the north on the right. If you look, everything is reading normal for you. You're standing right in the middle between those two. And each of those little arrows that are pointing up are these orange flags. And then the little star in the middle, that's the middle of a rep. That means all four treatments are around you in that. So that little, that orange flag without a, that orange post without a flag on it, if you stand there, you can rotate and see all four treatments. All right, so what we did was our, our lateral, we, those four laterals, each set goes to a particular irrigation treatment. So we are taking, a, a, we have a reference ET, then uh, beginning of the season, the whole group that was working in California here and then in Colorado decided on it. it's a conversion factor from the a reference ET and we use that to kind of, we're trying to figure out how much water it is and we take an ET each day and we track that through the week and we try to keep up with that ET, what we think it's using for the week. And then we take 80% of that, 60% of that, 40% of that for the full season. Then we press a little more on the auto flower because there's conversation that it just, by the time it was done, we weren't really in the full irrigation system. We hadn't run it long enough. So we started at 100 and we went to 75, 50, and 25% irrigation. And if you look across here, I bet any of you would be hard pressed to tell me what treatment had 25% irrigation. And I bet you'd be hard pressed to find out what's 25% of that over, or 40% over here. So what we're thinking is that this plant doesn't need a lot of water. And what happens, we'll be harvest, we harvest these for biomass, we take the colas, and we weigh them and they'll be analyzed for how much, you know, what the productivity is of. So we'll get both bio, total biomass and uh, uh, TH, uh, T CBD production. Uh, if you look back on the other side of the page, what I want to point out to you on that bottom on the irrigation date is, this is today, so when we first planted this, we didn't have the drip system running at the point and when you first start a plant, the drip system was buried about six inches deep and about six inches offset, so we didn't have problems with root interference. Well, when the plants first go in and when you're seeding, you turn it on, they're not gonna get any water. So we had to irrigate initially for the first few weeks until the full season got fully established and the autoflower was germinated and growing. Once we did that, we made the transition over. During that period of time, because we were, hard, we were uh, putting on sprinkler maybe a quarter inch at a time, half inch at a time or whatever, over a period of about three or four weeks, so the plants, there wasn't really a lot of water added to the soil because a lot of that dries up during the day. But that totaled about five inches. Once we got into our irrigation regime for the season, uh, we started going. And so far to date, the full season, we put at 100% of our estimated value, 12 inches of water. If you know anything about crop water use, that's not much. Corn uses three feet. Alfalfa uses two or three feet and of water and so this is a, a I look at that water reduction use I mean we can use uh, less water or you plant a few more acres with the same amount of water and the autoflower seven inches of water all right that's almost dry land I mean how much water would be in the soil so we have these plants that we're, we're learning a lot and I know you heard a lot this morning about um, research research is like a grinding stone it grinds slowly but thoroughly and, and so, you know, the last few years there's been a lot of, um, what do you call it, gold rush mentality. Everybody's trying to do too many things at once. We don't do that very well. It's going to take time for us to ask the right questions, set up research. This is to answer one question. How much water does this use? 
not only here, but how much does it use in Fresno, how much does it use in Davis, how much does it use in Hermiston or Ontario or in Colorado. And with that information, we can kind of got a sense of how much water we need to be applying to this. So that's a, that's a real important thing. I mean, that's just one question for all these trials. We'll pull out other information from it as far as growth habit and diseases and stuff, but that's our big question. And so it takes time to do that. This is the second year. We did this at another location here last year. And um, uh, I haven't seen all the data from that, but we've, everything's been in and we're kind of, what we learned from that last year, we kind of added to this year, but still keep the focus on what we're doing on the water use because that's a real issue, especially over here where if you don't have irrigation, uh, you aren't going to grow very much here. Again, want to encourage you to stay engaged with our research centers. Uh, whether, you know, we happen to have the location here, uh, but some of you are from up, you know, up, in, uh, up in the valley, so you know, feel free to reach out to SORECT as well. Uh, you've met the, per the, the, the various extension and researchers that we have. Uh, please give us feedback. And, uh, uh, and let's get into the conversation. We will be doing some more formal outreach about getting input from growers as we move forward with a new project soon. And uh, I guess the last thing I would like to say, can we give a hand to all of our speakers in their preparation for today? Okay, so thank you, Govinda. Yeah, that's good. I knew you were over there. I just had, I know Brian's been over there. Yeah, well, there was a lab director before I started about three months ago. Oh, well, maybe before that. Yeah. Taken Hopefully you do, right? That's the, that's the old That's time. what I tell people, but I don't believe in myself. Thank you very much.